Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm Lucian, and today I'm going to talk about reverse engineering of error correcting codes. Um, it's so nice to be in Berlin. Uh, I did not, I did not yet visit this uh, awesome tower or awesome needle-shaped object. But anyways, I hope throughout this presentation you'll realize what is the um, uh, what is the relationship between a needle-shaped object and memory corruption. So yeah, let's go on with the presentation. Uh, do you remember Rohammer? So Rohammer, anyone? I cannot say, okay, I guess many people raise their, their hands. So Rohammer is still kind of uh, new, I would say. Um, first, it was documented in 2014. So what uh, it gives us, there's a, there is like a, a memory reliability problem, which uh, gives a primitive to that, that flips one bit somewhere or several bits somewhere. So maybe it's hard to control. However, in 2015, like one year later, someone already showed the several exploits. So basically, these, these were privileged escalation exploits. Um, there was a kernel, uh, kernel exploit that was uh, using the row hammer um, to change uh, some, uh, some bits in the page table entry, thus uh, mapping uh, some resources that were used by the kernel. So then you can also do like a sand, sand, uh, sandbox escape. So this was already known in 2015. Um, yeah, so uh, about mitigations, um, there aren't that many yet. However, everything is work in progress because we still want to thoroughly understand how Rowhammer is working. So we are making progress, but in order to uh, propose a decent, uh, a decent solution, we really have to understand uh, uh, the phenomenon. So my work is actually in the direction of mitigations, but um, it's more offensive because I'm, I'm going to show why one of the uh, defenses doesn't actually work. So um, let's do a refresher on how Rowhammer is working. So let's assume um, we have this is like a, a view of memory. Memory, could, uh, memory cells are organized in uh, rows and in columns. Um, with the code snippet on the right, we can trigger uh, the bit flips. So the code snippet is just a, a tight loop that accesses two rows. Uh, which are uh, a part one, which are a part uh, one row. So they do have uh, another row which is not really accessed now. And if you do this fast enough, uh, for several times, the row in the middle uh, could expose uh, a bit flip. So you, while you don't have access to this um, to this row, you manage to cause somehow a bit flip in that row. So in another part of memory, uh, you manage to, to to have a right one bit or or, or more primitive. So this is uh, this is how a uh, row hammer is working. Um, we can take two properties which are interesting for for us today. Um, so the row hammer can cause some bit flips, not uh, like an infinite number of bit flips, not any bit flips. So uh, they they uh, they also depend their position and uh, the amount of bit flips that you are causing. It depends on the. Um, on the hardware configuration and on other low-level uh, properties of the of the machine that you're uh, running on, but also another property is that everything is reproducible. So once you find you found uh, some bit flips on one machine, you can reuse the same machine again to trigger uh, those bit flips. So this is what we're going to um, uh, to work uh, with. Um, in terms of defenses, by the way, I skipped already the software um, software defenses for Rowhammer. Maybe you can talk. Uh, we can talk uh, afterwards. But uh, let's look at the harder defenses. What do we have here? Um, we have target target row refresh, which basically it's a harder mechanism that will track the amount of accesses to to these rows. So if if the if the this amount, if you access these uh, these rows uh, many times in a, in a short period of, of time, um, and you are above a certain threshold, then uh, what will happen? Uh, this mechanism will refresh the uh, adjacent rows, so the rows that I just uh, showed now. Um, this is something that is fairly new. Uh, it's been pushed in the LPDDR4 standard, but uh, however, uh, it requires collaboration uh, with, the, with the firmware. So the BIOS has to somehow enable this, and also the memory controller has to be aware of all of these things. So by default, it doesn't come uh, uh, enabled, for sure. Um, now, th this is one of them, which probably will be we will see in the future how it evolves. But uh, since Rowhammer was um, discovered, uh, on servers, everybody thought that uh, ECC is kind of good enough uh, for um, so error correcting codes are are uh, one of the another defense for this. However, error correcting codes weren't really designed 
to defend against uh, row hammer. They were designed to defend uh, against uh, bit flips or memory errors, but uh, those bit flips could be completely different. So they 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 do have some 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 different uh, things. But however, row, uh, ECC is still uh, is still uh, uh, a good a good defense probably. But the question, and also everybody knew that once you have enough bit flips, actually you you would bypass ECC. Um, Okay, but the question is, how good is uh, this uh, error correction code uh, for um, uh, for row hammer? Um, by the way, error correction error correction codes are really uh, used a lot in in servers. So row hammer didn't uh, wasn't really so much of a problem for let's say cloud providers because they have uh, they have uh, good hardware with with ECC support. Uh, so uh, our our research we want to target now um, uh, to understand we want to target and to try to answer this question how 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 can we um, how good is ECC and in the end how can we bypass uh, ECC or is it possible or how how many bit flips it will take at the end um, let's start with the in gentle introduction in, in uh, error correction codes ECC 101 there will be ECC 102 I hope we can make it till there um, so uh, out of all the bit flips that we have some of them will be detected by the error correction code, and some of them are not detectable. Um, some of the detectable ones will be actually corrected. Uh, this is the role of the error correction and detection at the end, right? Um, for row hammer, in the row hammer context, the interesting uh, bits are the ones that are undetectable, so the silent corruptions. So if we can, we can cause these, uh, the, the bits in, in this, let's say, data, data set, then uh, we can have a, a row hammer exploit. Uh, we want to do this without triggering the detectable ones. So if we corrupt a bit and that one is detected as being corrupted by the error correction code, if the machine or uh, if our target uh, machine is uh, configured correctly, it should probably crash the machine. So uh, we want to avoid always the detectable ones. And our goal would be to uh, find undetectable bit flips. But the thing is that uh, the boundary between undetectable and detectable, it's not really a clear boundary. So what do I mean by that? Um, for instance, let's take sec dead. I'm going to use this term uh, uh, not in a, a very uh, thorough way, but uh, let's stick with this. So sec dead stands for single error correction and double error detection. So the thing is that for sure any uh, one error will be corrected. Uh, and for sure uh, two errors will be detected but there, there's no specification uh, and there's no, um, uh, th th there's no specification about what will happen with more than three bits. So there's no guarantee there. So what actually happens in practice, depending on the implementation, some of the uh, three bits errors uh, will, sti will still be uh, detected, but not all of them. There will be three bit errors which are undetected. So actually we want to look for these uh, three bit errors, let's say, that are not, uh, are not detected. So as you can see, the boundary, again, between undetectable and detectable, it's not really that smooth. So we want to provoke, uh, to cause the silent, uh, silent uh, memory corruption. Um, yeah, so to, to further target our presentation, it will be something that uh, uh, we want to find the minimum number of bit flips and also their position that ECC cannot detect. So why the minimum number? Well, uh, because with row hammer, we cannot, uh, we cannot actually trigger an infinite number of, uh, uh, of bit flips, right? So with row hammer, we can trigger several, several, several bit flips, and we want to have the highest chance to actually uh, trigger bit flips such that the ECC cannot detect. So this will be our goal for, for uh, this reverse engineering and the motivation uh, behind it. So I think I, I hope I convinced you why error correcting codes are interesting in the row hammer context. Uh, let's see why reverse engineering of error correcting codes, right? Because I already gave you the, the theory, so it should be kind of clear. Well, as I said, the boundary between undetectable and detectable is not really clear. Um, and uh, what we can, uh, it's not really clear. So um, why reverse engineering then? Let's see how ECC is implemented and uh, what ECC I'm going to target in this presentation. Um, so first of all, uh, let's see how it works. So this, the CPU wants to uh, 
write some data to memory. What it does, it will compute uh, some extra control bits with the data that, he want, uh, that the CPU wants to write, and it will write both the data and both the control bits at the same time. When the CPU wants to retrieve data from memory, it will retrieve as well the control bits and as well the data. And then it will do some sort of computation on this data and figure it out if there was an error. If there was an error, it may as well correct it. So everything is implemented, the, the ECC that we target is implemented in the CPU. Um, there are some interesting properties with this, uh, with this um, implementation of, uh, of, of ECC. So as I said, it's implemented on, on CPU die, so it's a purely hardware implementation. There's no much, uh, I mean, it's, there, there's no code behind it. Uh, probably there is some very low code. Um, it is completely transparent from the CPU in the sense that you cannot, uh, the, uh, you cannot explicitly uh, access the ECC part, the control bits. Um, and other properties are that uh, optionally uh, for, uh, reliability, uh, for reliability and high availability in servers, you would want to figure it out when errors are actually corrected. For example, if you have lots of uh, errors uh, within a certain uh, DIM, maybe it's time to replace that DIM. So this is a, this is a good practice. Um, and also it must be very fast because this is on the critical path and the data is not too useful if, uh, if it has um, uncorrectable errors uh, on it. So you want to detect this and you want to act and you want to implement it very fast. Um, but another interesting property, uh, and probably that's why we're doing reverse engineering, is that this is largely undocumented. Maybe you can find in some CPUs what kind of uh, guarantees uh, they will offer you, like, uh, like a SegDead kind of implementation, but this is about it. You w wouldn't find uh, all the details. Sometimes you can find some details about errors, but most of the times you just say you, you just you just find that uh, it will correct to uh, it will uh, detect two errors yeah. and not much more than that. So we uh, and as, as I said, the implementation, uh, the boundary between detectable and undetectable, the one that we want to look for, um, it's kind of implement, uh, implementation specific. So how how can we try how can we read this uh, the ECC bits? Well, there are several uh, several ways. Um, for any problem you have, there's a tool probably. Uh, you can always buy a, a tool, which is a, a testing equipment used to test um, or yeah to, to test uh, memory behavior and to actually get certification. You can use these kind of tools to to tool to to debug, but uh, to debug uh, your memory controller. But this is a fairly expensive tool. Uh, and uh, we don't want to do that. And in addition, there are other other tools, but sometimes they do not support the mm, reading the ECC part. And these tools are fairly expensive. The question is, um, can we do better than this? Well, with reverse engineering, I'm going to show you two two things. We can. Uh, w I'm going to show you two attacks that are, are aimed to reverse engineer the ECC um, the ECC uh, the, the control bits, right? Uh, one with the one is based on a fault injection, and one is based uh, on a cold boot attack. Uh, yeah, so this is the kind of the uh, uh, the, the long in introduction for my presentation. Let's see. Um, this is the ECC 102. I hope you don't get scared. Uh, anyways, I cannot see too well from here. Um, so we have. Uh, we have this parity matrix, which is some, let's say, um, some, some, yeah, it's a parity matrix, which, which is just a matrix, which is used to encode and decode uh, this, uh, the data that the CPU writes and reads. So this is the uh, construction that has nice properties and that is easy to implement, that is easy to implement in, in hardware. Um, most of the times, um, things are implemented with, with, with a XOR operation. Uh, the takeaway from this one is that everything is uh, uh, based on matrix multiplication. When you're encoding data, so when the CPU you write data to memory, you just multiply uh, uh, the data that you want to write, you multiply it by this uh, parity matrix, and uh, when you're reading the, the data, you compute a so-called symbol, a syndrome, uh, by reading the data and again uh, uh, multiplying this data with the parity matrix. So again, the, the encoding and decoding, they do have in common the parity matrix, and in short, the parity matrix will give you the ECC code. 
um, now we can view this parity matrix a bit different than and all of these operations. So basically, if you have one bit asserted in uh, in the data that you want to write, basically you're going to select just one uh, one row of the parity matrix. And vice versa, if you have one error in the data that you just retrieved, you're going to select a, a, a row from the same parity matrix. So in in, in other words, in, in other words, basically this um, the syndrome. So the, the error that you are going to, to, to observe, the syndrome and the ECC part are really tied together through this uh, parity matrix. Um, okay, so the question is how do we reconstruct the ECC? Um, so I'm going to try to rephrase the previous slide because I think there was way too, much, way too many things on it. Um, so stated differently, for sure the, the syndromes, so the intermediate results of ECC are reported to, to the operating system. Um, now, this syndrome is as well used to, to do error correction and detection, and we have some, uh, some, some equations there. You can also view the, you can also view the ECC as a, as a, as a big table, which is indexed by uh, a symbol, which is a bunch of bits that are adjacent, and uh, a symbol on one, di one direction, and the other direction could be the symbol value. Um, also, when you're computing the syndrome, uh, another simplification that you can do is just to read the um, to to do a sort between the ECC that you you retrieve from the memory and the ECC that you just uh, computed yourself. Um, to, to intuitively, you we could say that ECC decomposes bit by bit. Uh, as I said, everything is implemented in, in XOR, and this is a property of uh, of the way the ECC was uh, w w was chosen to, to be easy to implement in uh, in hardware. So there are two two interesting properties: uh, the ECC value decomposes bit by bit, and the ECC is ve is very related with the syndrome. So basically, the ECC we could say is equal with the syndrome. So if you have uh, if we treat ECC as a function. And uh, let's assume this function takes a 64-bit uh, value input, uh, and uh, this uh, this input has just only one bit asserted on one of the positions. On one of the positions, if uh, if we write this data, our ECC value will be written uh, in the control bits. And then when we read the data, if we fault uh, the exact bit that we asserted previously, then we will observe the syndrome, and that syndrome actually is exactly the same as the ECC that we just wrote the memory. So this is the, the base of our attack. So the, the last equation is kind of the most important one from this old math thingy. Okay, um, so that was, um, that was the, the base of our, our attack. Now I'm going to introduce the fault injection uh, based reverse engineering. So the thing is that, uh, to, to rephrase everything, if you have a single bit error uh, in every position, uh, then this, uh, this will allow us to actually uh, recover all the, the, the complete ECC function. And with this, we can, we can predict what value will be written in, uh, in memory. Uh, so what we have to do to, uh, to run our attack is just to, co to cause uh, uh, a single bit flip uh, in the data that uh, that we're reading, and then try to observe the this syndrome. And with the syn syndrome, we can compose the whole ECC uh, table. But how do how can it cause these single bit errors? Um, again, uh, we can look at the, through documentation, and some uh, some uh, motherboards they do have some memory controllers they do have resources such that you can actually do um, memory error injection. But this is not really something that is standard. Another, another way is to actually use row hammer to inject these errors and then observe the, um, and then observe the syndrome. But then it will be a bit hard uh, to uh, see where the error was injected. And also, you don't have that much control. So these are, and also the um, uh, bit flips will be corrected if you do just one. Um, so that is hard to, um, to observe. And, Again, for any problem, you'll have a tool. The problem with these tools is that they are fairly expensive, and I'm not really sure if it comes to the NDA or not. But uh, in any case, if you see a tool like that with, uh, without a direct price, it means that uh, yeah, it, uh, it will take time to actually get to, to that tool. Um, so what uh, can we do better than this? Um, 
Well, so we will propose a cheap and effective fault injection method, uh, and I really think it's it's very cheap. But we should start now uh, to see where the bits are actually stored. So this is a non-ECC DIM, and yeah, obviously the bits are stored in the black chips. Um, but the, the takeaway is that this interface is fairly standard, actually. This is a DIM, right? Um, so, for example, the ECC DIM has only one extra extra chip, and those are the control bits. While we don't care exactly, we don't exactly care about the control bits. It's actually good to know how things are 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 mapped in reality. Again, all of that this interface is standard. So, for instance, let's let's say we want to fault a single bit, right? Um, we can start with the data sheet of the of that DIM. Uh, DQ maps to one of the bits. Probably DQ0 maps to let's say the the least significant bit. Bit. Um, this is pin number three. Okay. We also have. It's easy to get the the, the pin number. So again, this is a standard interface, and also you can find some some of these numbers on the PCB itself. So we we know where pin one is. Um, we can locate easily even on the motherboard where DQ0 stands, where where the signal that we are we want to fault is. Um, now, how do we actually fault a signal? Um, well, we just want to create, so it's an electrical signal. We just want to create a perturbation, right? Um, we should be able to inject some sort of current or or, or play with, uh, um, yeah, or, or play with, uh, yeah, we should be able to just uh, do some sort of perturbation there. Um, our first idea and the way we started this project uh, was a, a bit random, so we had like a pre-test, I would say, where we just use a piece of wire of, uh, like, I don't know, five centimeters and with a thickness of, of one millimeter, and we just stick it there in that hole where, where the arrow of DQ0 points to, and we use a lighter. Um, yeah, so this was a piezo electric lighter, and, uh, yeah, being... Uh, this piezoelectric lighter actually had like a, e, uh, a big EM spike, so a big electromagnetic spike that was picked up by our antenna, um, which was just a simple wire. So we could see ECC errors at that moment, and we said, yeah, maybe we should do a project now because this looks like fun. Um, but yeah, then I realized, yeah, but I don't want to move that wire. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the, the, the lighter will break. So let's see if we can build something even better than this. Um, Wow, so there's a nice signal there. Uh, next to DQ0, we have a, uh, let's say, a ground signal. Um, maybe we can short that with this thing. So we built a very expensive probe with two, uh, from two syringe needles um, that are, yeah, they are, they are uh, apart like, um, so th um, the distance between the, 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 two the, the two tips of the needle is exactly the distance between two holes uh, in that um, dim socket that we just saw before. Um, and also this is high isolated, so I mean, it's yeah, plastic in between. Um, yeah, so this was our probe. Um, this worked fairly well, so we also used like a tweezer to short out the to short out the, the the two needles, and we are observing errors. It was a bit more stable than the previous solution. Um, it worked nicely, but then we realized that yeah, actually the VSS is next to most of the signals, right? So we can do the same for any signal. This was this was great, and and actually, if you look at the pre, uh, at the footprint of the of a uh, of a dim socket, you could see that next to any uh, signal, data signal, you would find the VSS signal. So the idea is that we have this uh, uh, mechanical constant probe uh, that we can just move around and short the VSS with the data signal. Yeah, so pretty good. Um, so in this way, we managed to, to do fault injection in all of the in all of the um, the yeah the positions of DQ and by the way this footprint also holds true for DDR4 so we started with DDR3 but this is true for most of the most of the dims out I mean, for all of the dims out there because uh, usually you want to uh, put a VS uh, a VSS signal next to a data signal such uh, uh, on the PCB and um, the reason for this is you want to keep uh, um, uh, signal integrity as, as much as possible so this is something that again is, is a standard thing um, so yeah our probe and we will have a fault injection demo with our demo gods in mp4 format
yeah, with uh, with no sound. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's my hand, and uh, I I I just set the the probe there on DQ3 I th on DQ0 and VSS. So currently there's no fault being injected because the two needles are they they are not in contact. Uh, the machine is running, so there's no problem there. So fairly stable. Uh, that's that's um, yeah modified Memtest version uh, that just reads from uh, from memory, random memory, and you can see on the right hand there's there are the syndromes being reported. Yeah, this used to have sound, but it uh, I I stopped. And right now I'm using the tweezer to short out those two th those two pins. So you can see the errors on the right. They're going go they're going up. Okay, so this was our our needle. So it was a a nice uh, a nice way to actually inject errors. And also, this this method would would work as well on. Uh, I guess I can, yeah. Uh, so this method works uh, works on any machine in theory, as long as you can observe the syndrome. So let's recap a bit this attack to see what it actually takes, because I just showed you how to inject an error. Um, so the idea is that the CPU will fill the memory with uh, with all bits asserted because this shunt acts as a pull to zero now. Um, then the CPU will start to to read, so we can write a nice program to to just read from from the memory in infinite loop. Uh, we can short a specific signal, and uh, with with our custom probe, and then we observe the the syndrome and we gather this. We, we gather it in a nice file, and and then we just move the the probe to another signal and so on until we we do until we recover the syndrome for every every position of this uh, let's say 64 bits um then then we use the the equations that i was showing you before to to solve the and to figure out the ecc table so all the syndromes uh if we observe all the syndromes for all the all the bits being faulted then we can recover the full ecc function so in short this is the way the the attack works is there an undesired behavior? Well, we didn't get any machine crash. That was fine. I guess I was paying attention to stuff. Um, and the thing is that ECC will correct just one bit error. So that's why you won't get a, a machine crash. And uh, yeah, as I said, we can even boot to Linux and write a nice user space program that does the same stuff like memory accessing. Um, yeah, we also figured out that the memory bus is quite resilient because if you think about it, when you design an expensive server board, you want to have some sort of protection of, I don't know, random random dims being sticked in your board, right? We got no magic blue smoke, but yeah, your mileage might vary. I'm not saying you should do this. Um, yeah, there are some downsides as well. So indeed, it doesn't look safe for the victim. However, we didn't have any problem. Uh, it's a bit error prone. So uh, those uh, yeah pins are fairly small. They are next to each other. You have to uh, somehow coordinate when you're moving the um, the probe with uh, I don't know with someone else writing down a number for you or things like that. It's also time consuming. We can also make a joke how many grad students it takes to inject enough errors. And luckily to answer this question, probably it doesn't matter because um, yeah because we have no life I guess. Uh, yeah, so this is a comment that was posted. Uh, so our work was, um, and as well with the ACC uh, Rowhammer, I was, our work was or, was already, uh, yeah, we, we, we published in the news. Um, and uh, yeah, someone commented that uh, we have no life. But anyways, if we have no life, then uh, I guess we, we know how to get around this. We will get a life. And what we do, we're going to build another, uh, another way to attack this uh, ECC memory. Um, to actually figure it out again, the ECC function. So there were uh, there were other drawbacks of the of our approach. As I said, it's fiddly, and you have to do it for every every target that that you want to figure it out. What if you can do it just for only one target, and then use this information to actually build a nice uh, memory dumper based on ECC? Okay, so this is the target of the second uh, part of our talk. So in, a gentle introduction in cold boot attack. Um, so we know that uh, memory content survives uh, uh, after power, wo power off. Of course, it, it's like a limited uh, period for which it survives. And this highly depends on the temperature. Um, we can access this uh, uncleared memory either on the same host, which is called probably a reset attack, or on a different host. So basically what we can do is we have like a, a victim machine. 
um, and we have a host machine and we, t we have some interesting data in the victim machine uh, which uh, ends up in, in, in RAM. We cut the power of the, the victim machine. We just quickly take the, the dim out and put it on the other machine and then we start reading the memory there and hopefully we will get some plain text uh, keys or passwords. So this is the cold boot attack in short. Uh, right now if you're lazy and you cannot do it like very quickly you should use like a, a spray like that which is uh, for um, which is for fault location uh, and that spray will cool down your your dim such that you don't uh, you don't lose that much information. So actually the retention time um, we could recover like I don't know more than 95 percent of the data that uh, the victim just wrote by just uh, having the 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 dim around one or two degrees Celsius. So it's not really crazy. You don't have to go to the North Pole for this. Um, yeah. So we also have a demo with this one, and the demo god is with us again. So I'm going to uh, to explain the cold boot attack. So. <coughs> There are two machines here. So yeah, the one on the up is the victim machine for which we don't know the ECC and the one down is the host machine for which we know the ECC. So the idea is to figure it out the yeah, the ECC on the unknown one. We have some freezing spray. Actually have several boxes now. Um, yeah, it's non-conductive. So yeah, the goal is that we want to recover the ECC function of the victim machine. Well, um, so we're going to start with the host machine being powered off and the victim machine of course writes some data to memory. I'm going to apply the spray so I'm not uh, stressing myself that much so it's like two or three times it's more than enough. Yeah data is being written right now to memory by the victim machine. Yeah I had to set up a timer to cut the power to the server. Apply more spray and 10 seconds should be about now. Okay, so I'm moving the dim and I'm turning on this machine. Right, so right now the, the host uh, is booting and um, yeah, we wrote a program such that we again log all these syndromes that we observe. Right, so this also dumps all the information on the serial because. Uh, that machine is not too stable though. And right now we recover all the syndromes. So the, the idea is that we know the data that we just wrote. We know the data that we just observed. We know as well the ACC function of the host machine. Uh, and yeah, everything again is based on SOAR operations and we can recover the ACC right now on the victim machine. So this is a, this is a, a recap. So at the end we just gather the syndromes on the, on the host and we can learn the ACC victim by applying those equations. So this was the cold boot attack. However, there, there's a problem. Um, so when, uh, when a machine with a ECC memory uh, boots up, um, it has to train the memory and as well any other machine that boots up from scratch has to somehow train the, the memory link. But if it's ECC uh, memory, it's very important to clear the memory before you use it. Um, why is that? Because the memory initially has, let's say, random data, so you cannot make an assumption there. And this random data is as well valid for all the chips, including the control bits. So then you cannot uh, start reading the memory without getting ECC errors. So what any machine with ECC uh, will do with ECC memory will first try to clear out the memory or try to write something to, to this memory. This is a bit bad for our attack, right? Because uh, right now we're we going to, uh, when we're moving the, the dim from the victim to the host, the host will first reset this memory. So how come we got syndromes before? Well, um, on what are our options? So we look through BIOS if there's a memory clear uh, uh, enable or disable uh, switch, but there wasn't any. I know some, some other boards, they do have one, but we were, were using this one. So um, yeah, what can we do? Well, the obligatory IDA Pro screenshot, um, there, this is the BIOS. Uh, it's, it's not a EFI BIOS, it's a kind of old version BIOS, the canonical, the old one. Um, and we managed to reverse engineer parts of the BIOS and especially find this, uh, this, awesome, um, this awesome call. Um, and yeah, the, the, the call we just knocked it out, um, which yeah, seems reasonable. It 
the machine was still stable. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, th this goes in the direction of uh, Alex's uh, in introduction, uh, the um, keynote speaker from yesterday. So yeah, you have to look around when you're doing reverse engineering, and we observed that some similar code was contributed to Core Boot by AMD, and this code was include was including as well the memory initialization part. So that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah, there was some checksumming uh, bypass uh, happening at some point, uh, but yeah, I won't go into details. Uh, I had to reprogram several times the, the BIOS chip, not really that complicated, maybe, um, yeah, it took some time, I would say, at least of that. Right, so with, thi with this hack in mind, so we, we managed to uh, do the cold boot and, and, and to do the, um, the generic uh, victim, um, the generic memory dumper, right? So this memory dumper right now works for any, uh, any machine that, uh, that has ECC memory, right? So you just can use any any victim uh, right now with this uh, with this uh, machine, and I'm going to open source yeah parts of this one, so you can actually use the same board if you want and flash your own uh, your own BIOS image. I guess you can flash it now uh, even through some nicer interface than the the clip that I have there. Right. Um, so I talked about the, um, the fault injection attack. Uh, and how do we reverse engineer with that, and also with the cold boot, right? Um, but yeah, it remains the question, okay, so how about the row hammer part? Well, uh, uh, this talk is not really about this row, the, the attack itself, but the idea works like that. So we propose the ECC ploid um, attack, and it goes like this. Uh, first, you have to find the ECC algorithm of the machine that you target, and this is fairly easy to do. Uh, so if you have access to some uh, cloud machine, you can always uh, do uh, cloud proc CPU info and look for the CPU that is being used there. After that, you can try to get a similar machine that you control. And the ECC function is not really that dif is not different at all between the, the two. So if, if it's the same version of the CPU, it will be the same uh, ECC function. Then the next step would be to do some sort of online analysis and try to find correctable bit flips on the target machine. Uh, you want to do this without going detected. So this kind of will take some time. Uh, the idea is to find one correctable bit flip at, at a time. Uh, now, once you have enough correctable bit flips, uh, um, you ca and once you know the, the ECC algorithm, you can combine all of these correctable bit flips to cause a silent memory corruption. So this was uh, our goal from the beginning. And uh, basically in this way, with the ECC algorithm, basically you know the clear boundary between undetectable and detectable bit flips. Uh, yeah, the row hammer exploit is fairly similar the, with the known one. The only differences are in the, the phases, in the initial phases when you have to gather all the bit flips. So this would be the, uh, yeah, the, the main difference, I would say. Right, uh, but again, on this um, on this talk, I was focusing only on reverse engineering the ECC uh, functions. Um, you can find more on uh, on our paper uh, at SMP uh, this uh, this May. So, in short, the bro hammer uh, exploit will work even in the presence of ECC nowadays. Um, it is kind of slow. That's uh, that's least to say. You can find more information there. Now, I don't have a logo, but I have a, a quilt. For you, so this is based. Uh, the quilt was generated based on the on the uh, on some ECC properties of uh, that we, that we recovered. So basically, I'm not sure if you can see, but the main diagonal of this one is completely black. So there are like black black dots there. Every pixel on the um, every pixel on the yeah. So 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 this is like 128 by 128 pixel image. And every pixel uh, represents the Hamming distance between a ECC uh, value that I that was obtained by just asserting that uh, that position in the in the data stream. So um, that's why you'll have the same ECC for on the main diagonal. Yeah. To to wrap it up, um, I showed you two two attacks: the fault injection and the cold boot attack, with the goal in mind to reverse engineer the ECC. Uh, functions and these are important because in this way we can understand how much uh, ECC buys us for the uh, row hammer attack and how good of a defense uh, that is. 
I hope this picture makes more sense now for, for you. Thanks. So we got about 15 minutes of questions, four questions. Do I see any hands? I call it the after lunch effect. <laughs> Um, so, Lucian, um, so I was wondering, you said you, um, oh, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, you said you can recover the ECC for any kind of uh, machine now with the damper. Yeah. Does it make any assumptions on like how many bits this ECC can correct or like what kind of ECC it is? Um, no, there's, there's, yeah, I would say there's no, there's no much of a difference. Uh, the, 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 the key point is that you have to disable the errors. Um, so uh, this this dumper will um, access lots of errors which are not correctable. So you have to make sure that this dumper is good enough to to stay alive even if lots of errors are not corrected. Um, and once you know, once you have a, this one which is fairly stable, uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a matter maybe of. Uh, Remapping or or reusing the equations some, some somehow uh, differently, no, but yeah, indeed the 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 host that we we, we choose uh, has 128 bits per let's say ECC word, and we use this one to reverse engineer uh, a um, machine that has 64 bits per ECC word. Um, this was a difference that we actually observed it while reading the data, so we had to cope with it somehow in the sense of doing the, the proper equation and proper computation. But this is easy to, to spot. So yeah, it requires some work if there's a complete mismatch between them, but you can still get around. OK, thanks. Thank you for the talk. Uh, maybe a dumb question, but what next? What next? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. So, <clears throat> in in terms of raw hammer attack, or no? I'm just. It's really interesting to understand what's the next steps. I mean, maybe you have some ideas about it. Uh, yeah, let's see. So we can go uh, in the direction of uh, more reverse engineering if we want to. So for instance, there are there is memory scrambling happening, and this can be as well reverse engineered with the memory dumper that we have. So you can you can read the the, the, the scrambler if you if you want in this way. Um, other things is is to actually understand the mechanism of uh, Again, memory scrambler in the context of row hammer, is it important or not? So this would be maybe interesting to figure it out uh, as well. But so far, it seems not to be uh, a good. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter actually. Uh, yeah, what next? So um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. We can definitely talk more about this, and we can brainstorm about it. Uh, yeah, I was curious uh, why are some of the bit flips undetectable and when you were looking at that, did it seem like there might be a scenario where you could not actually successfully exploit it due to the, the undetectable range? Due to what, sorry? Like, like you, you rely on only correctable bit flips, right? But you have to be within that area to, to successfully exploit it? So the correctable bit flips to actually figure them out is the like online analysis, and then uh, you carefully look for these bit flips, and you you can actually uh, make sure that you're going to get at most one at the time, and that one is always correctable. So this is part of the row hammer exploit, and once you uh, got one in one row, and then you can let's say uh, get one in the same row, 
but not at the, uh, the same time, then you know right now that you have two bit flips. Maybe you can find another one, and you'll have like three bit flips. And right now, both uh, you you detected them online, right? So, but you detected in a way that they were just corrected. And the question is, how do you detect them being corrected, right? Um, once you detect them being uh, corrected and you have like three, you can say, okay, according to my ECC function, which I reverse engineer offline, I can trigger again the same three bit flips, but this time uh, all, three bit, uh, all, all three at a time. And I'm going to generate ACC that is actually not detected at all as being an error. So in this way, we managed to combine the corrected ones, the, the whole three ones, in an uncorrectable one. Oh, perfect. Uh, uncorrectable three ones. Of course, right now we have to change. So if we look at the row hammer uh, a bit down, if a PTE entry will map over this one, then these three bit flips must be asserted. So if you have the same direction, then it, it becomes a bit of a dependence, uh, uh, row hammer dependent on the data now. But yeah, we simulated this one and we can probably get around this one as well. Okay, then let's have another round of applause. Thank you.